Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, Crypto and Thanks button in the info box below the video. Speaking of Patreons, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon. So a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to Original D Rose, Rod, the name's Burley, Todd Wazzle, Jason Hornsby, Christoph Fournier, John Travolta, J Mals24, Unimento, M, Iron26, Endless, Flat Earth Sage, Goldie McKinnon, Retro Bill, More Books, Canna Bear, Bogey, Michael Kahn, John Kays, Patrick Gunnels, Banter, Will, uh, Brax, Melby Styles, Harry Blade, Mobile Max 777, Neo the One, Rob W, Reese Pound, Dal West Watson, Maria Neelands, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, The Real Gabster, Abraham Mohammed, Skeptic936, Life is Short, Texas Mike, David Wayne Foster, and Dank. So another massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. Now before I do hand over to whoever is on Discord and Google, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a channel and the moderator specifically before plugging my Give Send Go campaign. So the first contributor to my Give, Send, Send, Go campaign was Goldie. Now, Goldie's a moderator in this channel, but she's also a moderator for Growing Up in Scientology YouTube channel. And I, I want to plug that channel, so I'm going to hopefully pin a link to this in the Uncut and After show so you can go straight to this guy's channel and check him out, A. Aaron. Um, now, I don't know if he's actually going by Aaron or Aaron um, because he introduces himself Actually, I won't spoil it. You'll you'll figure that out within the first 10 seconds of going to one of um, Growing Up in Scientology's videos. Now, my um, way about finding myself there watching videos and listening to the live chat and interacting with the live chat and seeing Goldie being a fantastic moderator, if not the best moderator, because she models herself on Divergent Droid. Now, Goldie in the chat, as I say, is the first person to have contributed to my Give Send Go, but the overlap is what I'm going to talk about first. So, I was looking for um, parallels with people coming out of Scientology because Scientology is a heliocentric based religion. So I thought there might be something juicy and therefore I started digging and having a little look and have been for quite some time. Now, for the most part, it, when I found comparable things, it felt like I'd be kicking somebody coming out of a cult in the ass when they don't need to be. In other words, they've just found themselves escaping one cult. Why necessarily <laughs> give them the next shock that the heliocentric model is also not true? Because that's all I could find. I parallels with people coming out and saying, look how stupid L. Ron Hubbard's descriptions of people being shipped around on these passenger planes and corpses in um, uh, Thetan form in, in volcanoes and great exoduses with, on, like I say, I can't remember, DC-7s or something of that nature. When, when you pull apart that and parallel it with, well, you know, go into space in a tin can when the sky vacuum's not real and things of that nature is a parallel but isn't necessarily what would be beneficial to someone who's just broke free of Scientology. So as of yet, I've not found anything juicy beyond the uh, deliciously nonsensical L. Ron Hubbard musings that he has written down and indoctrinated tens of thousands with, if not hundreds of thousands with, in Scientology, a registered religion. But it's parallel with heliocentrism serves me no interest beyond the remnants of that, which I've definitely stuck with, which is the Growing Up in Scientology channel. Now, a. Aaron is an absolutely superb host, and he's very, very cheerful. Now, he's an ex-Scientologist, as the name suggests, the channel's name suggests. Um, but he has a very similar attitude to me in one regard, which is to say he has found the joy in the world that surrounds him after escaping from Scientology, and talks about that with great glee and delight, and his interaction with his live stream and his chat is also the same. You know, it's, it's, it's very upbeat and happy, and pleased to be alive, so I get the impression. Um, and like me, in the regards to my escape from heliocentrism has bring, brought me much joy, uh, despite the fact that I still cover the subject in some of the negative aspects that you know anti-flat earth, for the most part, brings, um, as does the indoctrination of the heliocentric religion in the first instance, again, comparable with growing up in Scientology. But for that reason, I feel it's only appropriate that I recommend the channel, as opposed to to pour scorn on believers in L. Ron Hubbard's Scientology religion. But just to say, this is a good channel. <laughs> you'll enjoy going there. And you'll get to see Goldie doing a great job in the moderating uh, uh, field. So, yeah, um, as I say, I will um, put that up in the uh, 
uncut and after show stream uh, along with going to my um uh what was the other thing i am i give same go which is how this ties in so i may as well go to that now so off the back of goldie and many others suggesting that i don't use gofundme anymore i'm i've made that redundant by continuing an existing campaign that had kind of fallen off the edge on account of the fact that somebody else had a more pertinent campaign that ran which was chocolate saying which has now been and gone um so i've left a bit of a gap in between and then not plugged the gofundme knowing full well that i put it up because it was easy and i'm lazy knowing that people had objected to it um um so yeah that had not done particularly well but as i say uh specifically goldie in this instance said look if you start the or restart the campaign on give send go I'll be your first contributor. And she was. So a big shout out to you, Goldie. So she's been the first contributor on this campaign. Now, I've set the original target on GoFundMe as something like £1,500 because I want to replace three amps that I've taken out of commission because they keep breaking. And I've replaced one of them, so obviously I've lowered the amount that I want. Now, to be perfectly brutal, the third amp is actually to offer some redundancy. So that third amp of the three, one I've bought already, um, would power my centre speaker, which I use when things break. So literally in the last two weeks, I've used that particular speaker before taking the other amps out of commission, albeit with my very old and ageing and constantly needing repair amplifiers. Um, so that particular replacement does just offer redundancy. But the other two, which is where I'm hoping to get off the back of this particular shout out to my own campaign, um, just so I can stop stressing about it. Um, so I've bought a particularly good amp that can be bridged and run in various different methodologies but it can also run two speakers at once which is what i'm doing now because i've just got one of them um on the rack so it does run the speakers it's just pushing it beyond its limits which is fine temporarily but ideally i just want one on each speaker that's how the setup was currently running and how it was optimal just with a guitar amp now rather than a really nice expensive hi-fi amp so that's the setup i'm using as i say a, a, a guitar professional amp whatever you want to call it pro amp um, that's not as nice but that's not the purpose of doing this it's to make sure the show's reliable as opposed to me getting great joy out of hi-fi which is behind me now so this is more for longevity and reliability and all those good things it's a very different type of amplifier to what's outgoing um, but it's reliable um, but it won't be if I continue to push it to its limits by overstressing it but that again is one of the reasons why I wanted this particular amp to be just duplicated in multiple ways so that if one of them breaks I can just substitute in another one um, or use it in a slightly different way or swap some channels around and things like that so built in would be some redundancy but with only one I'm already using that element of redundancy now which is kind of stressing that amp that's brand new so it should be fine hopefully um, uh, a bit more than I would hope so ideally the point of pointing all this out is that I'd, i'm hoping to get about ideally half of what is currently being asked for uh, because there's one on well actually two on ebay um that are slightly cheaper than the new retail price and hopefully i can haggle them down by 10 or 20 more pounds um which would get that particular amplifier to around 400 maybe 410 pounds um so i'm hoping that off the back of shouting it out in this instance i can get one more amp which will directly affect how i monitor the show as it will be directly powering the show 99% of the time unless it breaks and then the third which I'll probably you know save my pennies and get myself or you know use whatever funds I can scrape together or whatever um, so that I've got some peace of mind and redundancy on top of that um, but in the meantime I'm hoping to achieve about 400 pounds and obviously I'm already 60 pounds of my way there thanks to Goldie so big shout out again to Goldie um, there will be a link also to this along with the going uh, a growing up in Scientology's YouTube channel um, which you'll see mo moderated by Goldie in the best possible way, emulating Divergent Droid. So that's it. Those are the two shout-outs um, for the first 10 minutes of this Uncut and After Show. Um, but yeah, hopefully you'll all contribute to this, just because I'm particularly stressed about it, and have been for a number of years, if anybody's <laughs> been watching the show for a long period. They'll know that I've had endless woes fixing bloody amplifiers that are 10, if not 20 years old, in the case of one of them. Um, which is not unexpected, but yeah, it's time to buy some replacements. Probably my kids screaming in the background as it is Easter today, if you're watching this after the fact. Or Easter Monday, I should say. Um, so yeah, that's enough plugging for my Go For Me. The, uh, not Go For Me, my Give, Send, Go campaign. So yes, um, the only thing I would say is if you do actually contribute to the campaign, like with Go For Me, um, there's a, a tip amount that you can, if you choose to, um, uh, offer to Give, Go, give, go Send, or whatever, Give, Send, Go. Um, down here um, but after you put in the amount it's entirely up to you if you did want to particularly support give send go then you can 
but whatever you like they automatically set it to a certain amount i personally would set it to zero obviously that's entirely your bag if you choose to do so but that's the way i would do it anyway that's enough plugging of if send go hopefully i'll be able to get to my 400 pound if not 800 pound target but in the meantime hopefully i can get to 400 pound in a fairly short period of time and that'll put me at ease for a reasonably significant amount of time Anyway, with that, I will actually hand over to whoever is in Discord and Google so you can enjoy their dulcet tones while I do set up for the live show. About? My schoolwork. Uh, not yet. Okay. Did you look at the response video then? What response? I'm, I don't know what conversation I've just joined. In on ignore one. that one. Okay from duper pooper i can't remember what his name is oh duper prunes yeah. or whatever he's called deeper duper pones now i haven't yeah, seen his response a... video what i did see was the thumbnail to a response video and it had the word atmosphere in it so as soon as i saw the thumbnail i'm like whatever not interested well he said science is true whether you uh, believe it or not and then he just put in a bunch of uh, assumptions and presuppositions that he couldn't prove and sounds called about them right. science yeah it sounds about right he struck gold with a concise summary of a load of logical fallacies and now he thinks that we actually respond, want to respond to him so he's a fairly cons uh, regular commenter but he now thinks that we're interested in him it's like no you've employed cgi and it's rendered a video that has a concise summary of all of the fallacies from the last seven years that's useful beyond that what you you think that that warrants a response no no it, it's the ai summarizing your crappy arguments for ages and that's why it made a nice five minute video because <laughs> because the ai was so concise that doesn't mean we want to get in a tete -a -tete with you dumbo but he obviously he's taking it the wrong way that, that's fine he's dumb Nathan, in uh, Master D, I've got a review video for you to consider today. I have a short day again on Monday. It's Neil deGrasse Tyson. I posted a screenshot where the topics are, so you'd have to move to the 217 mark to start rather than at the beginning because they just talk too much there about nothing. So Earth's orbit, Earth's tilt, orbit of other planets, Earth's moon rotation, precession, libration, levels of detail, size of the sun, variable stars, ideas, closing notes. First hit this when we asked the question, what, um, what is the path of Earth's orbit around the sun? Okay. Now, if, like I said, if you don't know anything about orbits or planets or solar systems, you're just brand new. You walked out of a cave. You've been there your whole life. You've not been indoctrinated to beg the question of orbits that aren't proven and are an assumption. If you haven't had that indoctrination, then... I will say Earth's orbit around the sun is a circle. So, so if we assume Earth's got an orbit around the sun, so immediately we beg the question that Earth has an orbit and it's moving around the sun. So in the first breath, after telling somebody what they'll do after they come out of a cave, not knowing that we beg the question of orbits, is with the orbit we beg the question of, first words out of his mouth. <laughs> it's pitiful, really, when you can break it down. <laughs> He's trying to convolute it and make it more complex by introducing some guy from a cave to get to his begging, the, to pad out the bit where he begs the question. <laughs> it's just sad. He totally isn't. The whole thing is a big in the question. We move on. Right, next. Earth's tilt. 539. That's hands. Let me guess. I'm taking a guess here. So because the Earth sits on a tilt of 23 degrees, it's not about how close we are. It's about where the sun is hitting us on that that tilt correct and so if you tilt it towards the sun the rays are much more but if you assume 
we are on an axis tilted towards the sun. Wow, this sounds familiar. <laughs> you, you may you may want to go back a few seconds because they're talking about why it's colder when you're closer to the sun and hotter when you're farther from the sun. Just prior to that. Oh, we got that. I mean, that's 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 the reason for the begging the question fallacy. But you've you've inserted it now. That that's perfectly sufficient. More direct. Wait a minute, did you just say correct? (laughs) Yes, I did. (laughs) That's exactly correct. (laughs) Get out! So watch. So if you tilt towards the sun, um, as we are in January. But if we are tilted towards the sun, we are tilted towards the sun. Right. And just repeatedly begging the question. Then, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, we are in July then the, the ground heating is much more significant and that's that's what takes us into summer meanwhile the folks in the southern hemisphere are tilted away. Hem of the what now begging the question spherical below you antipode no and no, we definitely don't assume any of these things so we don't assume orbital motion we don't assume begging the question axes we don't assume tilt we don't assume antipodal positioning but in the last two minutes that's all he's done rattled off a whole series of begging the question fallacies that's it that's all he's doing but away away that's, that's why they get winter when we get summer and I then- was- right so not just the begging the question fallacy also the affirming the consequent so that's called an affirming the consequent formal logical fallacy formal formal because it's got form p if p then q q therefore p so if the earth is tilted then we will observe seasons as thus we observe seasons as thus therefore the earth's tilted in an orbital motion and affirming the consequent formal logical fallacy because the Q statement doesn't necessarily follow the P statement. So if the Earth's tilted, we will have seasons. Whoa, 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 whoa. Why? Well, because I assume it is, and this is how the model models it out that way. Yeah, but why? Why is it that we would assume the Earth is tilted, therefore seasonal effects, beyond you begging the question of it being tilted and therefore seasonal effects? For you to then go, hey, 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 seasonal effects, therefore tilted. It's, it's pathetic. And it's switcher. I was really guessing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very good guess. Chuck. I thought you were going to say, well, that makes a lot of sense, Chuck, but. Okay. Oh, yeah, that makes sense in your head. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so now, that, now they're all good with the ellipse. And I say all the planets are in ellipses. All right, okay. some are less so than others. What, so now they're good with me telling them that they are in an elliptical motion. Now they're good with that. I wasn't good with it. I pointed out that you've just told me that we are in elliptical motion simply because you say so. But your assumption is that I'll be good with it. So I haven't come out of a... Oh, let's not spare the audience my French. I haven't just come out of a cave, right? But that doesn't mean I accept that you just simply stating that we are in an elliptical motion it means we are. I don't accept that. You know, a caveman wouldn't either. He'd, he'd want some justification. All right, why? Can you establish that with some sort of evidence? No, it's just the begging the question fallacy. Oh, I see. Pluto is particularly elliptical in the long list of weird things about it. And No. That was, the whole idea of having these elliptical orbits is, is it Kepler. I believe it's Kepler. And this is at the behest of the church. They've got to figure out when the patterns will line up to give them Easter so they can tell people when Easter is. Coincidentally, it's Easter Monday. Well, that necessity to know when that pattern would give them the next full moon so they could tell them that the the people, that the Sunday afterwards would be Easter, was put down to... I'm going to say it's Kepler. I'm pretty sure it's Kepler. Yeah, it's Kepler with the, with the ellipses, isn't it? I'm not wrong there, am I? I don't know, I'm a bit hazy. We've had a couple of days of not doing a show. Anyway, the point is that that's at the behest of the church. Just lining up the patterns in models. That doesn't mean we have got elliptical orbits. Especially when they were just invented at the behest of the church to better understand the patterns so they could predict when Easter would come. Doesn't mean we are. And uh, Venus is particularly circular, but everybody is some form of an ellipse. Okay. Okay. So now we're, we're good there. And that's how that's where most people are. That's where most people have been left. Absolutely. But there's more. Okay? Uh-oh. All right. If I act now, will I also receive? <laughs> but wait. So now what? <laughs> so uh, Earth and the moon orbit each other. 
Okay. Okay, so we're not just sitting in one place with moon going around us. The moon and Earth each orbit their... All, all this is going to be is him telling you what an orbit is and telling you how Earth is doing this. So explaining an orbit isn't isn't explaining how we have orbits, why we have orbits, why would you suggest this in the first instance or in any way just to find the beg and the question policy that's used after then, what, going on to describe something? This is he never tells... He never tells how this stuff was uh, calculated, you know, from what measurements they calculated these orbits from. He's not mentioned that yet, has he? No. I just looked it up. It says it's a law, Kepler's law. Well, Kepler's laws were invented by Kepler. Interplanetary motion. We often talk about the derivation for scale, which is the third law that Kepler gave the church. These laws of motion are his way of describing the motions of the stars. Now, by describing them with ellipses, he could better or more accurately predict when they would line up to give me stuff. But that's his imposition of ellipses onto an existing circle so that it can better, be, better line up with the timings that they get wrong up until that point. But him inventing an ellipse, doesn't mean we're in an ellipse, it's just his way of better explaining to the church so that they can have a better prediction for when a certain event will happen in the lights in the sky. That's all it is. All Tyson's right. doing, as opposed to explaining where he's got this information from, which is what we've just done, is just telling you what it is in relation to the world that you actually exist in. No, wrong. Go ahead, whoever. I'll go after John. I was going to say the calculations that they're going to employ come from flat earth elevation angle measurements applied in the celestial sphere so um orbits require flat earth oh dear yeah um i'm looking in britannica and it says right here and i'll post it in a second kepler himself did not call these discoveries laws as would become customary after isaac newton derived them from a new different set of general physical principles so even Kepler didn't call it laws. I'm going to spin on a little bit to the next thing that sees, seems of interest. I'm, I'll read out the list in case anyone says, oh, no, we must cover that. Earth-moon rotation, that, that's what we're covering now, right? And I'm happy to move on knowing full well that he's just going to detail what he says is elliptical motion. No. We've already covered it. We've pulled it apart. We don't need endless detail from him about the description of that Kepler-based assumption. I, I, I do on. want to challenge it. Well, you can go ahead. I, I'm just going to tell you where we'll move on to afterwards. So after that, we've got procession, libration, levels of detail. That I'm a bit... I don't know what that means. I'm maybe a bit ambiguous about what he means. And then I was going to move on to, because I don't see those as particularly relevant or important. Um, but the next one that is, is size of the sun. But yes, feel free, Adam, to to cover in terms of um, Earth moon rotation, maybe a bit of precession orbits and such like. Well, just just a little little point. What he's describing is elliptical orbits. Um, you look on screen. That's that's what actually the heliocentric model describes. That's not they're not they're not elliptical orbit orbits. There's a lot more motion. So even in his own world, he's simplified. And I can understand why, because this, this pile of trousers that they're actually claiming, this, is, is so unbelievable. And part of the critique that when you've got um, Kepler and that, they're looking at the predictable motions, the spiraling, the retrograde motion of the, of, of, um, of the wandering stars, the planets. Um, and that's part of the critique. No, 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 look. They don't do this spiral in motion, which is why orbits makes a lot more sense. It's just going round. But like I said, if you put all of those motions into the heliocentric model, then you end up with an even more convoluted set of movements for the uh, wandering stars than you do with just the flat Earth assumptions based on their predictability. And then this is the difference. We're not claiming anything in an Arwinian way. We're not claiming anything in terms of us. They're claiming these are physical objects doing these physical motions. When you look at 
old school astrology. It's just telling you where they'll be following the patterns. There's no claim as to what they are. There's just extreme accuracy in when they'll be there. Cool. You click hide and just press play for a couple of seconds. Poor effect. Thank you very much. But it seems we're just getting explanations. We're getting just so story, aren't we? There's no, I think John mentioned that there's no actual validation for why he's come to these conclusions. He's just telling you what, what Narnia is made of, isn't it? Adam, uh, it seems like the summary you gave uh, deserves another summary. Let me try it and correct me if I'm wrong. So basically, they, since the time of the Sumerians, Babylonians, they've studied the stars. They know the pattern. They know the cycles. And then, uh, of course, they were not heliocentrics themselves, uh, the Babylonians. And uh, then all of a sudden, when heliocentrism came into play, they started doing this stuff and making up just those stories so it could fit the heliocentric model that they have, whereas before, the, the individuals or nations, Babylonians, Sumerians, Egyptians, others, never did that. Yeah, well... It didn't come with a story of what they were and how they were moving, did it? They, it was the predictability of them that was there. Right. There was no need to, I suppose, from their viewpoint, it's the realm of the gods, isn't it? Um, so to try and explain that in a physical well, sense would be, would be nonsensical to them. It's not, it's not the earth for them, is right. it? It's just the heavens. Um, so some of, some of these cultures being pagan oriented, uh, they would serve these things as gods, uh, but they did nail the timing and when things would happen because it's a it's a pattern. It repeats itself. And then when you take something that repeats itself and then say, I predict it's going to repeat itself. Well, it's been repeating itself for thousands of years. What do you mean you predict? <laughs> yeah, well, that, and that's where Kepler and the church has got this info. They've got the predictability. They've got the patterns in a geocentric viewpoint. Um, but they're going to take that geocentric viewpoint and turn those patterns into what's being described here, orbits, where it becomes heliocentric. And this so, is on screen. So I'm glad you said that because I wanted to uh, dovetail into that because in celestial navigation, we have to assume, like the ancients, that the Earth is stationary and it's the stars that are moving. It's, <laughs> they're admitting to it. Anyone else want to cover anything before we move on? Oh, why does the tell you that a planet? I knew it. I knew well. it. Sorry. I knew it. I couldn't get off mute. I just wanted to say they tell you the same thing when you go to a planetarium. Sorry, I'm not quick enough. No, the miracle is you were on mute. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, how wide is the sun? Uh, on this, it, it's eight hundred and sixty-four thousand miles across. Okay. Okay. Uh, based on <laughs> based on the assumptions of Kepler, so. All of the stuff that is just detailed in terms of the orbital motions and, as we detailed already, Kepler's third law, you can get the scales. If you've got one of the values for the sizes of one of the lights in the sky already, they know all the motions. They don't know what the actual sizes are. So if you can give a value to Venus, then you can scale everything based on Kepler's third law. And then that gives you the values of the distances to the sun and the size of the sun as just rattled off by Neil deGrasse Tyson. And, you know, it's, not it's quite It's the same in um, Narnia, you see. If you want to know how tall the lamppost is, then luckily you know that it's four Mr. Timbuses, right? But because when Lucy was there, she guessed that she figured out that Mr. Timbus was the same size as her, and she knew how tall she was. She therefore knows how tall the lamppost is in Narnia. Um, just uh, real quick, the 
the scaling values will be applied in the celestial sphere model. So that's a problem as well. So they'll need a flat Earth for that? Yes, they will. Billion miles across. All right. All right. And that's fine. And if you look it up in a book, it'll give you that number. But wait a minute. Um, the sun is a ball of gas. Right. So we're... Why isn't it expanding Stop, hey, into... Hey. Go on. A ball of gas in a vacuum. And that, that, I'm going back to non here again, mate. There's nothing here. He's just telling you what his beliefs are, but he's not supporting anything. It's just... So you may as well be describing non here. And the one point I would say, he's 800 and whatever. You'll need half of that, mate. Here is the edge. How are you doing the edge of that? What is, how is that? What? So, well, you say, okay, well, we, you know, you take a picture and you put a thing. Okay. Well, whose edge is that? That edge that you see is the last. It's the second law of thermodynamics violation, gas not expanding into a sky vacuum. Last point of light that had scattered on its way to the edge and then escaped the sun. But that's visible light. Right. So the light's escaping the sun, the gas, but the gas itself isn't expanding with entropic law into the sky vacuum. It's just nonsense. His explanation yeah, was... Yeah, but if you stretch your voice out like this and say the edge... Then what? It's much more convincing. Well, it's like was... he's got a persona, right? So he's living up to his persona. Uh, one minute you see him dancing on the disco floor, the next minute he says gravity. I don't know whether this next question. And then, but the uh, I mean, the guy's an actor. Listen, the way he says it, he makes it believable. So everybody just believes him because it's Neil deGrasse Tyson saying it. Okay, other wavelengths of light emanate from the sun at different depths. Ah. So if you took an X-ray picture of the sun, you'll get I'm a sorry. different dim I thought the sun was a full body spectral emission. So he's now claiming that the different parts of the spectrum are made up from different layers, give you the full spectra. You mean black body? Well, it's a black body, yeah, but it's a full emission. It gives a full emission spectra, doesn't it, the, the sun? You got it all right. But he's claiming that this appears to, I think that's what he's just said there. Some of the spectra is coming from one level, or some from another, which would be um, that the that gas, then what he's claiming the size is, is that's gas that's absorbed the light and then re emitted it. An emission spectra is what he's claiming now from the sun. Play, but it, it sounds convoluted or like he's, he's not quite telling the truth about what the sun is in terms of light emission. Gotcha. Dimension for how big the sun is than if you take an ultraviolet or an infrared. So, so when you just say how big is the sun, you can get an answer that satisfies most needs. But if you really want to know what's going on. So what are those needs? Can anybody list off why we would need this value? Anybody at all? No? Maybe Tyson will tell us what, what the you know practical application is. Going on, you have to get into the weeds. Right. And you've got to dig in and then say, how are you defining it? And how does that vary? And how big is that difference? And, there and how does this have any influence on us whatsoever? Beyond scaling values being arbitrarily assigned, what difference well, does it make to us? Well, he's, he's just, well, oh my goodness, he just answered your open invitation of being a gas giant in a vacuum, a violation of, of uh, how gas pressure works. So let's get deep and get the info on how that is not escaping. Let's get into the weeds of the second law of thermodynamics with Tyson. And say, oh, 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 there's already a big flaw. You say it's gas in a vacuum. Definitely not. Yeah, it would expand, wouldn't it? Expand to fill the space. There are some stars that actually pulsate. 
And to say, how big is the story? You have to say, well, ask when, ask me when. Where in its cycle do you want to know how big it is? Right. Most variable stars in the night sky, the, star, the category star called variable because they get brighter and dimmer over uh, on a schedule, right? Uh, they get bigger and smaller. So some... So as opposed to if you film a lighthouse and suddenly the light gets really bright, it, does that mean that the bulb's got massive? That, that's what he's telling you. Because it flashes, <laughs> it means that suddenly it's really big. All right, so your lighthouse, the bulb just suddenly gets tenfold the size, does it? No, no, definitely not. Light intensity well, he's versus that... size. He's, he's, a tri he's ascribing physical attributes to light effects. That's what I was saying. Is he saying that stars are getting bigger and smaller? That's exactly what he's saying. Where, how do you oh want me to define God. its physical size? Well, it depends on its cycle of brightness. For how large, I'll say it is. That's precisely what he's saying. It's like a guy with a beer belly sticking his belly out to show off to his friends and then sucking it in. That star has that issue, I guess. Not really. <laughs> no, it's more akin to my lighthouse example because the light spins and as it reveals one edge of the light, it's going to be quite dim, but then as it spins around a little bit further, you get a bit more and so on and so forth until eventually it's very bright and big. If you were taking it in pixels, it would have increased. Does that mean that the light's increased in physical size like the man's belly? No. Tyson says it does, though. Some questions don't just have simple answers. Uh, right, you just said it did. You said it depends on when you measure it. That's a fairly simplistic way of describing a physical attribute in terms of measurement that you've just given us, but then told us what it's not just as black and white as that. That's because you haven't got a vaguest idea what the stars are. But, at, but not every educator is going to tell you that at every point. Right, so... Like, like you didn't. You didn't tell us anything about how you got this... <laughs> Uh, inf inference that you've made. Go on, whoever wants to. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, what field is he in? Astrophysics? Uh, can we see the hypothesis, please? <laughs> I was going to say, some things are very simple. You can't have gas pressure without containment. That's easy. Well, how is he going to tell us? If he doesn't have a hypothesis, he can't vary an independent variable. How does he know? Now, I have to ask this because you talk about variable stars. And, you know, we sing a nursery rhyme, twinkle, twinkle, little star. We also look up at times and we see stars twinkling. Do we that, that's not how the nursery rhyme goes, mate. Maybe you're unfamiliar with twinkle, twinkle, little star. The next line isn't what you just said. It's how I wonder what you are. Wonder. Now, Neil deGrasse Tyson's not got any wonderment for these stars. He's telling you what he says they are and how they vary in their physicality in terms of their measurements that he described to them when they flash. But he hasn't got the slightest idea. The wonderment is over for these people. They're just naming hey, stuff. Wouldn't that be the observation? And then, hmm, I wonder what it is. I wonder what caused that <laughs> phenomena of it flashing. No, it's getting physically bigger. Depends on what size it is at a given point in time to how big I'll say it is physically. All right, that's because it's physically growing and getting smaller. Yeah, the size of it is increasing and decreasing, is it? It's not just flashing. What caused it to flash? I don't know, would say Tyson. I know it's getting bigger. Depends how big I say it is, at what point I measure it. That's his attitude. We have time for you to explain why exactly do stars twinkle? Not in Sorry, that's not what they say in the nursery rhyme. How I wonder what you are. Not, have you got time to explain to me? <laughs> that's not, that doesn't even rhyme. <laughs> Hey, before we get into our oh, super damn it. cool show, we'd like to thank Salesforce for. Wrong button. She can Maybe see a little the bit into the weed edge and then escape about. the sun, but that's visible light. Right. Okay. Other wavelengths of light emanate. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. We also look up at times and we see stars twinkling. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. We also look up at stars and see them twinkling. Oh, how beautiful. <laughs> Do we have time for you to explain why exactly do stars twinkle? No. No, I remember it well. That's such a beautiful rhyme. Not in this explanation. Damn it! Video. <laughs> John we, got it! We can put that in another one. All right. You know, I can't put the whole world and universe right, exactly. in 10 minutes here. I don't know yeah. what you, what, what, you know, what, what do you, what do you want from me? <laughs> what, what do you, what do you, 
<laughs> I, I'm only one scientist. I'm, I'm just Jim. I can't, I, do, I can't. I can't do everything. I mean, he's just talking crap and making stuff up based on the rhetoric that he's parroting. So when he says he's a scientist, so, no, he's not. You know, you've got some misapprehensions about what Tyson is. He's definitely not a scientist. He's a star namer. Yeah, he names stars, gives stuff names, and disseminates predetermined information through begging the question policies. <laughs> so the point is, um, ideas matter more than any of these details. Really? Not evidence and proof and truth and empirical science. Just ideas. See, in a hypothesis, it's your idea of what might cause the effect if you were to vary it and see if it caused it. You know, ideas are important if you're forming hypotheses. That's why we ask your fields for them. All right, you've got ideas. Put it in a hypothesis. We'll see how important your idea is. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Are ideas empirical? No. In a, in a method of science, they're just ideas that are yet to be validated, a.k.a. hypotheses. Right. And so, yeah, the, it's an important idea that the sun goes, or Earth goes around the sun. It's just an idea, though, isn't it? Yeah, when we started this out earlier, nice that we've cut out all the nonsense in between, he, he made it explicitly clear that that's what was occurring. You know, if someone crawled out of a cave, you just tell them what an orbit was, and then they just know orbits were true, and that's what's happening. Now it's just an idea, yeah. right? Yeah, a hypothesis would be an idea that hasn't been validated. And that's precisely what this is. It's not even a formulated hypothesis. It's just an idea. It's sad that the world that we live in has their paradigm based on this garbage idea. He had a Freudian... Sorry. He had a Freudian slip. He was going to say the sun first. He listened again. And the rest are details. That's fine. And that idea gets you to other ideas. And it... Yeah, it does, doesn't it? You can beg the question all day. So, but without could, joking, let me just say this. What is so critically important about what you are saying is that when we look at the scientific method and we look at science itself, um, what it does is it allows you to open your mind to the possibilities of change. No, that's not what the scientific method does at all. It utilizes predictions in the form of a hypothesis that suggests one thing will cause another. Then you vary the thing you have an idea about. That's the scientific method. You, what you're detailing, it, it, no, the scientific method doesn't open up your your mind. Yeah, this isn't total recall. Yeah, you're not talking to some alien. We're talking about a method of empiricism. It's not open your mind, Quaid. Yeah, that's not science, Dumbo. Debate live. I'm your host, Nathan Oakley, and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon, and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, crypto, and thanks button in the info box below the video. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcome back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. 
Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel. So please share the show on Facebook and Twitter. Now, before I do introduce our guests today, we have a new hooray, platform to do GoFundMe's on, but it's no longer GoFundMe, so it's now Give, Send, Go. So I have started a new campaign at the best of a few people that are particularly irritated with the campaign starting out on GoFundMe. So off the back of GoFundMe, I have bought one amplifier of, of three that I'm hoping to replace. Now, ideally, so that I can do the minimum to keep the show running, I want two, and hence I've asked for the remaining amount that two will get me, which is about £900. So ideally, I'll get one of them out of just plugging it a little bit, and then I won't have to go on on it about length because I'm stressed about it, um, having tore out the old and unreliable stuff that keeps breaking, and I've got a single replacement already, which is the bare, bare, bare minimum. The redundancy I would hope to have, should things break, is being employed already with the first amplifier, which is great because the show works, um, but I'm a little bit stressed about it. So hopefully I can get at least one more, which would be about, I don't know, £800 if I can get one on eBay, relatively cheap. So I'm hoping to achieve that amount within a few days. Uh, hopefully it'll be a bit more successful than the last one, because the last one on GoFundMe was uh, particularly unsuccessful for the reasons I've already given in terms of people not liking GoFundMe, and also because a, a, a more pertinent campaign came up in the form of chocolate sayings campaign. So that one kind of got left on the wayside and uh, won't be revisited. Indeed, GoFundMe won't be revisited from this point forward. And uh, should there be any campaigns, indeed, like there was for chocolate saying, I think Give, Send, Go will be the preferred platform. So if indeed you did want to support me on Give, Send, Go, there will be hopefully a link that will go by. Uh, I'm sure I can do that myself now, actually. Um, give, Send, Go dot coms forward slash FED is the full title and I'll stick that in the live stream chat now. So check that out. Also, I wanted to do a shout out to Goldie, who particularly said that if you leave GoFundMe from campaign use and use Give, Send, Go, I'll be your first contributor. Now, just before the weekend, I did set this up, albeit with a bit of a pain to get in through password <laughs> foibles. Um, but um, uh, my first contributor was actually, um, why doesn't it show it? Oh, there we go. Goldie. So there we go. Two days ago. So thank you very much indeed for being the first contributor on Give, Send, Go. Um, Goldie, really appreciate it. And in the pre-show, I did a little bit of a plug and shout out for somewhere where Goldie is a moderator, which is on the Growing Up in Scientology channel. So the Growing Up in Scientology YouTube channel has the best moderator because Goldie's there and she emulates Divergent Droid, who is the best moderator also. So um, check it out. But as I said in the pre-show, um, Growing Up in Scientology has just got a really fantastic host. So Aaron or Aaron, but he introduces himself with a little clip where he introduces himself as A. Aaron. It's just a really lovable character who's high on life having escaped a cult. So I can directly relate to that, finding the wonderment in the world that I find myself in, having uh, severed myself from the nonsense and lies of the cult of heliocentrism. Now, although I haven't found any useful parallels beyond stuff that would knock people leaving a cult, which I don't necessarily want to do, um, what I have found is this wonderful channel that I'm more than happy to plug, because I think other people who just go there and listen to the guy talking in general will pick up on that vibe that having, as the name suggests in the YouTube channel, escaped a cult, um, has got a, a very positive outlook on life, one that I also like to feel that I have. So just check it out for nothing more than the entertainment value of an ex-Scientologist talking about his experience, covering some current events in Scientology, and just generally passing a lot of joy onto the world with his YouTube channel. And Goldie in the moderator, uh, as a moderator in the chat, because the chat's also joyful too. I have a lot of fun chatting away with people in his, in his uh, live stream. It's a lot less toxic than it used to be here. So there we go, that's Growing Up in Scientology, and that's my um, Give, Send, Go campaign, which hopefully links uh, will be going... Uh, Pine our divergent droid, of course, right on cue there with the link to grow up in, growing up in Scientology YouTube channel. So check him out, and indeed, like always, say, tell him in the most positive of context. Nathan Oakley, nineteen eighty channel sent me. If you leave him a comment, help him in the most sincerity with the, the algorithm. Leave him a comment, leave him a like, subscribe today. Uh, I'm not just saying it for the hope that he'll you know make a video. In fact, I don't want him to. Uh, I think he wouldn't necessarily benefit from poisoning his you know uh, audience that have left this cult of Scientology um, by throwing them further down the rabbit hole of heliocentrism itself being a complete fraud. Um, but they might find their way here naturally, so let's just hope so. Um, but it would be nice to help him in the algorithm and obviously just let him know. Nathan Oakley, 1980, sent me, if you are going right now, which I hope you would, 
and um, and subscribing to that channel. And uh, indeed, giving me money on the, my Give, Send, Go campaign as Goldie has done, the moderator from that channel. So that's enough of the plug for Ghosts, uh, Give, Send, Go. Uh, the only other one thing I would say is if you did contribute, like with all of these um, campaign platforms, um, they do give the opportunity to actually contribute to them also. So I typically would set that to other um, and then set it to zero. Um, that's obviously entirely up to you if you'd want to give to Give, Send, Go. Um, but there we go. So that, that's that. And I won't plug it anymore on the show. Hopefully I'll get to my 400-ish pounds target so I can offer somebody a low ball price on eBay and get the second amp to replace the second of three. Anyway, that's enough plugging. Hello to everybody on the YouTube, uh, Discord and G+. How's it all going? Good to have you. Very well. I'll do a proper introduction. So we are joined Hello. by the Adam Meakin, Tenth Man, Neil, Paul, Arwin, and Refracted Curvature. Obviously, a whole bunch of people in Discord. So welcome, one and all. Hello, hello. Yeah, hello. let's get it on. Hey, hey. Buenos Monday. dias. Good morning, good morning. Buenos dias. Okay, so we're going to do a couple of housekeeping questions. Any evidence that you can acquire gas pressure without the necessary antecedent of a container to press upon? Negative. No, sir. Gas in its expanded state doesn't have any weight. Indeed, it's expanding to fill whatever volume it's got to fill, so how could you claim it's got a downward bias? It hasn't. It's expanding in all directions. What about the distance? Well, that, of course, mechanically, but also, like, you know, you can compress air, the regular air around us in a tanker, and then you register some extra weight beside the tanker. But if you take that same volume of gas and put it in a gigantic balloon in its expanded state, guess what? The weight you're going to register off the scale when you put that balloon thing on there is not going to be the same. Because it doesn't have weight, not in the actual way weight is calculated, which is based on relative density disequilibrium in a medium of air. Is it raining there? Is that the noise I can hear in the background of your mic? What? Is it raining? No, it's it not just... raining inside my room. <laughs> Obviously not. Is it hitting the windows and making a noise or is your mic just crackling? I think my mic might be crackling a bit. Okay. Yeah, there's something, something not quite right. It's very... Almost probably inaudible to everyone else, but an irritation to me. Anyway, any evidence of the distance to the sun? I'll get to why we've asked those two questions in a minute. Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson says he has it. And Neil's done it for me. So in the pre-show, we did reasonably extensively cover uh, a star talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson, where he's covering various things, including Earth's orbit, Earth's tilt, the orbits of the planets, precession, libration, which we didn't cover in the video, but we got to size of the sun. So that's why we're bringing it up in, in the housekeeping format at this point, because we're going to segue nicely now to exactly that. Oh, no, it's my Give, Send, Go campaign. Feel free to give generously. No, here we go. So this is Neil deGrasse Tyson explains why someone, uh, why some info is needed to know. And then he's just basically, I'll just summarise what we did in the pre-show. Begged the question left, right and centre and just told the audience that if you were a caveman and knew nothing of orbits and heliocentrism, that he would tell you what orbits were and expect you to just know that that's true because he told you. And then later in the discussion, he's pointed out that these ideas in regards to orbital motions and ellipses are just that, ideas. But he's going to stress how important it is to have ideas. And then this guy is going to explain, is it Chuck? It's going to explain how the scientific method is quayed with the alien on the guy's back telling him to open his mind because that's what the scientific method does, gets you to open your mind to ideas, according to this guy. So obviously we corrected that in the pre-show. So check it out if you aren't a member already. Obviously become a member, and you can see this immediately after it's been recorded in a couple of hours' time on this channel, Nathan Oakley 980. If you're not, and obviously you don't want to give me money, for whatever reason, if it's give, send, go, just share it, or send me a prayer for my amplifiers. But doing that is just as beneficial. So, you know, sharing the show, sharing this, sharing whatever. And in that vein, although it's a slight segue, um, I'm going to share this now. And as always, not necessarily in the same vein as growing up in Scientology, but go to Neil deGrasse Tyson and let him know. Oh, what have I done? Print. 
I don't want to print. <laughs> Go away. Uh, Go and let him know that we've sent you by leaving a comment that just says exactly that in the nicest possible way. Nathan Oakley 1980 channel sent me as they responded to your video or we love your stuff. So there it is. It's going by Diver and Droids also dropped a link to it. So if you can just let Neil deGrasse Tyson know, Nathan Oakley 1980 sent me. Can't remember what I've segued away from now, so I'm just going to carry on playing the video. And say it is either this or that. Or who, th or they think scientists have rigid thinking. Right. That, 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 that leads to... The, 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 they think rigid thinking of scientists, do they, Mr. Suttery? No. No, we don't, we don't concern ourselves with how rigid the thinking of men is when you're talking about an empirical method that employs cause and effect reasoning in a hypothesis exercised through experimentation to establish the cause of the effect that you supposed. Those ideas would be, I think, I've got an idea about what caused that effect we're studying. Maybe a light flashing in the sky. You could go, oh, I've got an idea what caused that. Yeah, that's half a hypothesis right there. Just add the null. I think this causes it, mirrored with, I think this won't cause it. Then you've got a full hypothesis with null. All you need to do then is vary your ideas that are oh so important to you to see if they cause the effect. That's an empirical method of science. These two gibbering fools are talking about the ideas of men. People saying things like, I don't want to wear a mask because, quite frankly, the science is junk. And the reason they say it is because things have changed. We know more, so we well, I mean, change the way... What would be more accurate would be to say that if there is a cause and effect being established and the effect is directly linked causally to the man-made manufactured masks then that's outside of science because in this instance you're varying something man-made as an independent variable for a natural observed phenomena well that isn't exactly science is it so when you say it's science that what you've been demanded to put a mask on that that is what people's rejection of it because they don't like ideas because you think science is ideas. So the idea that people should have a mask on is science. What are you babbling about? Science establishes cause and effect. So the phenomena that you might be studying might have the cause of the lack of masks. So you vary masks and see if they cause the effect or the lack thereof in this instance. Equally valid. Like with scurvy. They vary vitamin C, the lack thereof causes scurvy, right? That's science. This isn't. So when people object to it, they might have flawed reasons. And you might be justified in objecting to their flawed reasons when they object to your version of science when you attribute it to wearing masks. But it isn't science. So while your objections to people's insincere and lack of understanding of science when they object to it, because you say it is, I would object on a much higher and more lofty grounds, which is to say that, no, this isn't establishment of cause and effect reasoning through systematic experimentation, therefore not science. That's how I would demean the claims that you are making in this instance. Well, he's Maybe equivocating is what he's doing. He's confusing an area of study with the scientific method and then calling it all science. Yeah. Last week, John... You said it needs to be repeatable, testable, observable. And um, it seems to me they're trying to jerry-rig the scientific method into Neil's ideas. Yeah. Well, that's a fallacy of composition because there are ideas in the scientific method. Your idea of what causes a phenomena, that's true. But if you just take science to be the ideas bit, no, that's mistaking hypotheses for explanations. Because when he explains elliptical motions and then later confesses to them being ideas, like well, your idea of an elliptical motion is something that, well, potentially not because it's derived in maths, but could be potentially put through the scientific method if you establish the cause of the effect that you're studying. And if the studying bit and the phenomena bit is motions of stars, then you need to vary a presumed cause to see if you can cause that effect. That's it. Now you might go, oh, well, I can't vary something to cause star motion, especially not with my heliocentric assumption that the ground's moving. I don't care. Yeah, science is very narrow. You're not going to get some broad tool that offers empirical outcomes. 
doesn't work like that. Yeah, it's very specific, isn't it? Oh, what, you can't sandwich in your ideas of motion into this empirical method. Oh, that's okay. Just don't call it science. And then no one will have a problem. Just stick to... My idea is... And then we can treat you like the village idiot drunk on 2020, standing on the corner, babbling about nonsense when we hear your ideas about what it could be. Meanwhile, science will establish the cause of an effect and save lives. Well, like with the example I gave, vitamin C, or the lack thereof, not causing scurvy because you put it through the method of science and establish what caused that effect. Saving lives. Unlike this garbage that doesn't do anything in practical application beyond reify your religious belief that came from the church to derive orbital motions to give us better predictive capabilities for Easter. Doesn't mean we're standing on a sphere. It doesn't mean anything. Then information... Okay. Based I was going to ask, would that be the sixth grade science you're talking about? Yeah. People are trained in what cause and effect reasoning is, i.e. the scientific method, when they're at a reasonably early age, that they know that it's empirical. But then when tossers like this come along and start telling them that they've got just so stories or ideas and then use the word very literally science or in this case have some shill co-host you do it for you so you don't get caught out lying but ultimately is tyson correcting him no of course not he's going to steal every bit of valor by way of his shill co-host he's looking at you in the eye saying yeah i'm a scientist no you're not but the fact that this guy's ascribing that to him He's going to take it. Tyson's not going to correct him. We will. Let him know Nathan Oakley 1980 sent me. Drop him a little comment. Help him in the algorithm where we get none for pointing out where charlatans steal valour from a method of empiricism they haven't employed, as we're doing now. Based upon an increase in knowledge or an availability of more information. Or the establishment of cause and effect through systematic experimentation based on a hypothesis, a.k.a. science. Correct. And so No, wrong. Not based on more knowledge. Not based on men's attitudes and how rigid they are. Wrong. Oh, so that's all correct. But an important difference, in most cases, there are very there counterexamples to this, but in most cases, the extra information is an improvement on what you previously knew. Not with science. If A causes B, there is no improvement on that empirical outcome. A will always cause B. No matter how many times you vary A, it will always cause B because you've established it through the systematic experimentation stage when you validated your hypothesis. Therefore, what are you going to advance with it? Or well, you know A cause B. Uh, maybe if I vary a bit mo more, it'll, it'll cause it a bit more. No, no, it still causes it. You can quantify it with mathematics, perhaps. But that's about it. Once you've got that empirical outcome, there's nothing really more to do. You might find out other aspects that are related to it and form theories with it. Yeah, theories, that's another word they'll steal valor from. Yeah, that's the end of the experimentation process. Once you've got several, you can form theories about things like plant growth. Once you've varied and manipulated cause of an effects that you've observed in nature, having isolated the independent variable you had an idea about and saw if your idea was true or not. Right. It doesn't completely... Yes. In the scientific method, how many independent variables are there? Clues in the title. Independent, on its own, alone, one, singular. Completely throw away what right. was previously learned or understood or researched. Yeah, that wouldn't be the case in science either. So while you want your just-so story methodology to go both ways, both offer up the ability to improve upon just-so stories with advanced bullshit, you also want the ability to reject old bullshit that was formerly held up as being true whenever it so suits you. Whereas in the scientific method, it goes both ways also. While you have validated A to cause B, it's not that somehow you'll come back in a year's time and go, oh, no, we're going to improve upon this A causing B thing. No, no, you will never change that. The empiricism bit forbids it. But in your just-so-story world, you need to be able to just toss out old crap that you were telling people yesterday because new crap's come along, right? Yeah, science doesn't work like that, though. Science will always have the same outcome. It's not like tomorrow we could improve upon knowing that vitamin C or the lack thereof causes scurvy. Are you going to improve on that, Tyson? I mean, that's real science there. 
And you're hinting at you having science. So explain, given the context of science, how you'll improve on if you don't get enough vitamin C, you'll get scurvy. Perhaps you can improve on that. We're going to get vitamin C++ plus 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 from Tyson. Stopping the super scurvy. No, you're not going to do that, Dumbo. And next year, it's not going to turn out that, oh, actually, we got it wrong. The lack of vitamin C didn't cause scurvy. That won't ever change. Uh, look up what the word empirical means. After it says to test by experiment, it'll explain that it won't change. So that's why I said with the orbit around the sun, each next thing is a nuance on the previous one. Well, just a new just so story layer of bullshit on top of the old one invented by Kepler. Yeah, we know. We disseminate it to our audience daily. Right. Right, when I say this... The Earth Speaking of which, please share the show. 80 people watching along with me live. 25 minutes. Not great. Please share the show. Obviously. We're not going to get to 100 people unless the people who are in the audience now share. It's not like YouTube are going to promote us telling their audience about their 2.3 million subscribed preferred content Star Talk channel. You know, they're not going to want to promote us at all. It's all down to you in the chat. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing so. You are all ace. Earth is doing loop-de-loops. You don't have to abandon the idea that it's an ellipse. But ideas? So you're telling us that that idea may be abandoned in a few years' time because you've got the open possibility to do that. But at this point, we're not going to abandon that. It's okay to hold on to that. What, the one that you told us when we got out of the cave? We're okay to hold on to that one that you told us because we didn't know anything and now we understand that you beg the question of orbits, therefore orbits. I see. We're going to hold on to that. Gotcha, Tyson. Gotcha. Because the loop-de-loops are on an ellipse, yeah. right? you got that uh, video queued up, Adam. <laughs> we'll have a little look at it. Not that you'll be bringing up a diagram. And yeah. so, so. You there? Yeah, I'm on it. Just uh, one sec. Just and real quick, if I may add, you know, it's very annoying to hear his sidekick, sideshow hype man running his mouth, who's supposed to basically just be there to like ask questions on behalf of like the neophyte nation that don't know no better and are supposedly, supposedly learning from him. What makes me annoyed is when he reiterates the asinine rhetoric that that Neil says as if, so you're telling it like some conclusive, you know, um, stuck in stone um, 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 answer that he solved the question and he's, he's solidifying the scientific method when he's not even a scientist and just reiterating all that nonsense. That really annoys me. I want to reach in the screen and just choke him to death because it's, it's, it's like he's getting away with it in front of so many people that they're literally thinking that Neil's a scientist, Neil's speaking on behalf of science, and yada, yada, yada. And this guy's like, yeah, so what you're saying is, and he just repeats it, and it's like, okay, we, we, we've, we've answered that question for, for the millions of listeners. Let's move on. And that, that annoys me. I don't know if it annoys you. That annoys me. So you can keep the, and keep the nested, in, it's like the nested Russian dolls. There's more detail, and, and you can stop where you want, and you're good with that. Sweet. Yeah, sweet. Just make it up as we go along. Stack it up like Russian dolls. If you need to go back through the Russian dolls and toss one of them out, one of the onion layers has gone rotten, just toss it out. It's great. The world's your oyster, right? <laughs> Wrong. If you're following the scientific method, it's got an empirical outcome. It's never going to change. You're never going to stack any dolls on top of it. Once you know the cause of the effect, that's it. You got All right. it. All right, Chuck, we got we to gotta land that plane. Okay. Well, next time we get to know why stars twinkle. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what it's all about. And we covered that in the pre-show when you bastardized twinkle, twinkle, little star and added a load of nonsense about getting a just-so story at the end of the rhyme. Yeah? W will we ever figure out what the stars are? I suspect not. We know their majesty. We know their patterns. We know where they're above at certain times. And we can use that to our effect when navigating. We can prove a flat earth with them. But what are they? We don't know. But this laughing clown will tell you what they are, won't he? He'll tell you how they're moving. He'll employ Kepler's assumptions to tell you how your world works. And it's all good because you can stack up Russian dolls. It's science. Not that Tyson said that. Chuck did. Not that Tyson corrected him. He just happily laughed along while he stole the valour of real scientists that save people's lives. While he offers you just so stories of elliptical ideas. He made it very plain what he's disseminating to you ideas well in science an idea is a hypothesis that's why we ask and as they're rounding out i'll round out with the housekeeping question 
Is there any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields of astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics? Negative. That's that it. would be a big fat. Uh, no. Well, that's it. Those fields are incapable of utilizing the scientific method. Why? Why is that, John? Well, there's a multitude of reasons. Uh, primarily, they can't manipulate their independent variable, but secondary to that, all their observations have an R inserted as a causal mechanism. Oh, dear. So that's In that statement is a very exceptionally concise summary of why the answer, you're going to need R for that, doesn't apply directly, but it also does apply indirectly with one step, which John just made clear, to the question, any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields of astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics? With most of the other questions in the housekeeping series, you can answer, you'll need R for that. And then you can further go on to say, you'll need a flat plane for that R. <laughs> or just cut out of the middle, man. You'll need a flat plane for that. But in this instance, when it comes to viable hypothesis, it's not strictly true to say, twinkle, twinkle, little star, I'm going to need an R value to know what you are. That isn't true. They will infer it immediately after assuming what it is and how the Kepler's orbital assumptions apply. So they will absolutely, immediately employ R. So John is strictly correct. But Next. to infer that it's done automatically when you simply ask them if they've got a phenomena, they might, they might astrophysicists that might, might work outside of the claimed heliocentric rhetoric to offer a cause and effect relationship one day. You just don't know stranger things have happened, but it just won't be directly connected to the R value assumption. Therefore, not important, not important to our subject matter, but we can't just say you'll need R for that to answer that. Thank you, John. That was good. Go ahead, Adam. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. I'm probably going to need R to figure out where you are, um, is what they're doing. So uh, and just to relate it to the housekeeping, what John said, if at any point within those fields, they're going to invoke distance, which is most likely, and all of those distances we discussed were scaled based on Venus having the same R value as us. So that's, that's why you say it, because as soon as they're going to put a distance in, that distance is a derivation of R. Of all the nursery rhymes that we get in the Western world, especially in English-speaking parts of the western world twinkle twinkle is the most predominant nursery rhyme by a mile every single child will know that nursery rhyme yeah well if you listen to the rhetoric of the nursery rhyme it's leaving you open to imagination and yet it's parroted through all of the well, I've just got, my kids have just come out of that age group but there's that that is in everything it's in the wind-up toys, it's in the radios, it's in it's in everything. The little discs that they play, you name it, it's all got Twinkle Twinkle in it. In the language lessons that they have, they translate it in, into various different languages. So it does make you ponder the, the prevalence of that particular nursery rhyme explicitly gets you to ponder what the stars are. It doesn't explicitly tell you what they are beyond postulation of them being diamonds. So when I went, when I brought that up, I think it was last week. I was sort of muffed. Yeah, but Brian had brought it up two weeks before you did, and he had much more. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but that nursery rhyme. If you're right, how I wonder what you are, and all we could do is wonder. And, and Nathan, and Nathan, to be fair, that goes for any flat Earth advocates that like to speculate and say, well, I think it's the waters above and it's, it's, it's the reflection of the, of the waters above in the firmament um, reflecting off of the lights down on earth from the buildings. And I've heard so many things. So that, that goes for them too. It's good to speculate, but stop trying to sketch in stone what it is because you don't know what it is. No one knows what it is. Well, so that goes well, for both sides. We might as well get a little twinkle, twinkle history. So um, twinkle, twinkle, little star. 
is such a familiar rhyme for children that we often forget the fact that it has a named author, Jane Taylor, 1783-1824. The rhyme is the first stanza in a poem in Rhymes for the Nursery, 1806, a volume of verse for children written by Jane Taylor in collaboration with her sister Anne. So it is actually part of a, a larger poem. There you go. Learn something new every day. I like it. I like the fact that it offers a child the opportunity to wonder what they are in the most literal and direct quote from that nursery rhyme slash poem. How I wonder what you are. And that's precisely what I do. When I think of the descriptions of childlike wonderment that I personally have as a flat earther, that is what goes through my mind. Literally, that nursery rhyme. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. And I, even now I smile while saying it. Because I do. I, gl I glance out my window even though it's daytime. And I think about all the times I sat in this very position, which is where my telescope used to be, looking out of the, the window I'm looking out of now. You know, the, the, the show equipment has replaced where I used to sit out and look at the moon or look at the stars through this window, wondering about them. Yeah, even when I was a heliocentrist. Well, that has been amplified tenfold since becoming a flat earther. I, don't, I, I know even less about what they are. So I wonder even more about what they are now. <laughs> so just like when I was a kid hearing it from my mom singing it to me. Isn't it nuts? Yes, Nathan, we really like this section on Twinkle Twinkle. Well, that's good. I thought I was becoming a bit of a baby bore there, but I'm glad you all agree. <laughs> I've, just, I've just gone to it. Um, I want to read the third verse. So we're all familiar with the first. Then the traveller in the dark thanks you for your tiny spark. He could not see which way to go if you did not twinkle so. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Wow, it's got a specific rev reference to the navigation aspects of the stars in the poem. My God, it's a flat earth poem. <laughs> oh, my God. Twinkle, twinkle, it's a flat earth poem. <laughs> That's incredible. What's the irony to that? Uh, uh, Isn't everything a flat earth? Yeah, that, that, I've told you this many times. Evergreen subject. Doesn't matter where you dig. It all ends in a flat plane. Doesn't matter where. We'll dig somewhere else soon. Yeah, the nursery rhymes are based on a flat plane. Why? They're specifically referencing the navigation use of the stars. Flat Earth required. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And things like this come up all the time. That's why I love doing this show. Other than being poor. Uh, speaking of which, I've got to give Senk... No, I won't. No, I will. <laughs> I've got to give Senk go going. <laughs> Donate today. But other than that aspect of it, the joy massively overwhelms. Like the fact that I've occasionally got an e-bag, uh, this outweighs it massively. That level of joy, just glancing out my window, thinking back on having a telescope. You know, it, it comes up occasionally in useful context, like it did the other day with um, Adam showing us his P900 footage. Me going, eh, that's not what I saw. You know, it's an interesting discussion point. You could call it a folly, but it's directly re related to the subject. Um, but it doesn't directly relate to me going, wow, isn't it great to be a kid again? Going, what the hell? Are what the hell are those lights then? What are they? Other than knowing how they're used to prove a flat earth. I don't know. I don't know what the sun is. I don't know what the moon is. I don't know what the stars are. I don't know what the sky is. I don't know why it changes colour. I don't know any of those things. <laughs> why am I smiling? Because that's wonderful. Maybe I'll be the one to find out. Maybe you will be the one to find out. If you're listening to this now, you might be the person that actually answers why is the sky blue please let me know if you do oh i should have let chocolate in sorry chocolate i was looking at the other monitor try again and i'll let you in by the way where was the link today how did i have to go searching for the link i don't know neil we we're trying to dodge you neil that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> I, I put it out really early. I started super early because I don't intend to have a very long after show today because it's Easter. So, yeah, but you didn't put it on. You didn't put it on. Um, Mass D. I did a lot. 
Uh, maybe I put it in the wrong chat. Maybe I put it in. Um, Good morning, FD everybody. Back office. Back hey, chocolate. Office. Anyway, we're boring the live audience. Like 100 people watching. Woohoo! Thanks for sharing, everybody who share the show. Really appreciate it. Smash the share button now. Should be thousands watching. Let's go. Smack that Good share morning. button. morning. What's Good. up, chocolate? Hey, chocolate. Peace. Peace. Chocolate. Good. Yep, yep. Happy Easter, everybody. What's crack a lacking? How's everybody doing? Down a bit down. Is everything okay? Say that again. You sound a bit down in downbeat, down in the mouth, whatever you want to describe it as. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm all right. I got a lot going on, but I'm, I'm all right. I'm here. Well, sounds How's like everybody. It. Let us cheer you up with the third verse from Twinkle Twinkle again now. Okay, here we go. <laughs> then the traveller in the dark thanks you for your tiny spark. He could not see which way to go if you did not twinkle so. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. You said that's the third verse of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star? Yeah. Yeah, it's a poem. Who knew? Huh. Not just Those the... navigators needed that. Yeah, it's, it's reference to navigation, so therefore it's a flat earth proof. Can't get an elevation angle measurement from a curve baseline. I mean, is there any evidence that you can acquire an elevation angle measurement from a curve baseline? Neil hasn't answered me yet. I've, uh, according to Matthew Learns, the answer is a few no. Times. Indeed, according to Matthew Learns, the answer is no. Yeah, but he's a bloody liar. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did we did we establish he's a liar or he's delusional? What's his story? That was last night's replay. Um, so I listened to a bit of that. And I, I'd stick with my stance. Intent okay, so, to deceive. Right, just to just to so you know what we're talking about. The, on the If you didn't want to become a member and you did want to watch the Uncut and After show, you get it several days later on my second channel. Subscribe today, Nathan Oakley. It's just not got the 1980 and there's a gap between Nathan and Oakley, but that's the name of the second channel. And yesterday I released... Um, the, the live show was covering a video that Eddie Bravo did several years ago where he was talking about balloons, which is very appropriate with the Chinese spy balloon, so that's what we covered. Uh, hence, he's in the thumbnail. But at the end of that video, in the last hour, which I also listened to yesterday, obviously, it's my show, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we were discussing um, whether or not Matthew Learns is a liar um, as opposed to trapped in cognitive dissonance or all of the other um, reasonings that, that were behind it. And... In that particular show, I, I was referencing Johnny Depp with his high standard of proof to prove malice in his defamation lawsuit against his ex-wife, Amber Heard. Well, to reference a slightly different lawsuit, but another example where people just want to justify why people are deceitful liars, right? Now, I'm not necessarily paralleling this directly with Matthew Learns, but I'm saying it parallels the discussion about Matthew Learns, which is to say that the, the guy... Colonel Sanders or whatever he's called um, that tried to sue Gwyneth Paltrow the guy was just lying but even the jury when they were interviewed made up every excuse for why he wasn't lying in his mind he made up the story and that's how the story has become processed in his mind as being true I'm like what you mean lying <laughs> that's lying <laughs> making up something that didn't happen telling yourself it did and telling everyone else it did that's lying but everybody wants to justify people's good nature some people are a bit too empathic it's like call a spade a spade if someone's a lying shit say they're a lying shit just say it <laughs> you know call it what call it what it is if it's a lie it's a lie now there's no way in that instance that somebody who's skiing down a slope quite quickly and then bashes into somebody, falls over with them, and then goes, oh my god, I've just bashed into Gwyneth Paltrow. And then Gwyneth Paltrow gets herself together, annoyed that she would be, skis off down the mountain, tells everybody how they've just taken out Gwyneth Paltrow via text messages, and then later has amnesia about how long they were unconscious when she hit them. That's just a liar, right? Somebody who lies? 
<laughs> but in the case of Learns, everyone wants to jump to his, no, he's got cognitive dissonance. No, he's trapped in a paradigm. No, he's not deceitful. He's just unable to come up with the truthful explanation. Uh, Hold on. Not everyone. John. John is the defender right. of Matthew Learns. What's right. it, a Bach? But nobody will answer answer me if delusional is a liar. Which is that a liar? If someone who's delusional? Yeah, I would say so. So, in 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 the case of you know purely quackery, how they define compulsive liars? Compulsive liars are often described as delusional. It doesn't change that when somebody says, you know, I'm going to get the FBI on you because my dad's in the FBI. And they aren't. They're just a compulsive liar and delusional. Because when you quiz them, they give you the backstory about their dad is in the FBI. No, that that's just a compulsive liar. So as far as I'm concerned, delusional, compulsive liar, same thing. Well, no, no, it's not, though. Delusional, compulsive liar may be a subcategory of delusional. But that's not what delusional is. Yeah, yeah, but John, but why do you not take into account the many years that QE has put into this, that he's been on 24-7? How could you still be defending that? You think me calling Matthew delusional is defending him? Yep. By their own low standards. <laughs> I'm saying delusional's one step above liar, right? So what Neil's saying is by their own very, very low standards, calling him delusional diminishes his liar status. So that's a win for him by their own low standards. Yeah, but I, I, would, I don't think that would be... Uh, I think I'd rather be called a liar than delusional. That's just me, though. I think it's crazy that we're even assessing this, given the, the brush that we get tarred with as flat earthers on a general day-to-day -day basis. You know, we are considered delusional. We are considered moronic. We are considered the idiots in the arena and easily overcome in our pitiful arguments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So as we get further down the rabbit hole for the anti-flat earthers and we sit here really struggling, bashing each other's heads in over whether or not someone's a delusional or a liar, well... That's because that's where the rabbit hole leads you to the, the defender of the original faith being the one that's being assessed for how delusional or incompetent or deceitful they are. Us assessing them is my point. Complete or it turnaround. could be all three. He could be a delusional and competent liar. I don't know. And that's really the, the standpoint I've, yeah. I've maintained is I don't know. Absolutely. That's the conclusion we always come to at the end as well, which is why we're so concise in this now. But yeah, we, we don't know ultimately, and it's not necessarily beneficial to our cause when we point out contradictions in their position. That You could describe lies or malice or incompetence to it at the end. Yeah, you could just call them delusional. But it doesn't alter their contradictions. It doesn't alter their debate points. It doesn't alter their affirmations of a flat earth that we require. All of those things still stand and stand in the case of Matthew Learns or Matthew Weathers. But interestingly enough, it does push the idea that there are two positions to be had, you know, and it creates a line where there's an enemy uh, to the, the discussion. Well, it's when, not a broad brush thing either. It's claim by claim of that person. So he could be delusional, uh, a retard, and a liar. Yeah, if I said that. Yeah, well, he, he could be all three at the same time within one claim as well. Yeah, I'd like to see that. I think Matthew might be uh, might be the best uh, subject for it. We'd really have to like dissect his brain uh, in autopsy to see, you know, what was going on. Speaking of, I really don't care. Uh, oh, God, that's not a good segue to what I was about to go to. <laughs> so, um, I shared a link yesterday. Did any of you watch it? It was from BBC Bite Size their latest ad for their channel. Anybody see that? Yeah, I no. caught that. 
little ad hom attack. Yeah. No, sorry, that was very dark, I thought. Yeah, I th I'm glad you dug out the clip so I can play it now, actually, because I, like with any advert, you don't know necessarily where to find it. So I just started recording as soon as I got an idea of what the actual ad was about. So this is um, BBC Bite Size. Want an upgrade that doesn't uh, cost ads. the... So the channel, I will um, not necessarily plug because he's just recorded B the BBC ad and republished it on his own channel. So I'm not necessarily going to plug the guy who's got this video published, but it's just an ad. So because it's not that lengthy, but we may have to pause a little bit of it just to, so they don't copyright me. What's with you're hearing audibly? We've got a guy standing on your typical flat Earth society pizza pie in a sky vacuum. So you've got a distant orbiting sun, and instead of a sphere Earth, it's a flat pizza pie Earth. And he's obviously proportionately massive compared to the map, and he's just in a suit that looks a bit rough and flipping a pancake, which has just fallen on the floor. With the pancake, it's flat. What else is flat? The Earth. Today, I'll prove. Don't learn off randoms. Revise with BBC Bite Size. We get. There you go. That's basically it. Just... Randoms. Yeah. The Earth. Today, I'll prove. Don't learn off randoms. Revise. Yeah, so that's it. That's the entirety of the ad. So it's just an ad hom. No whys or wherefores in terms of their assertions. Just don't learn off randoms. Okay? Stick with the, the Ministry of Information. If you want to know things. Yeah, make sure you go to the British Broadcasting Company who will tell you in a bite-sized format precisely what the world is. They want to give the Earth shape desperately, don't they? I was more interested in the fact that they had they they feel the need to dissuade. You know, it's not just allow anti flat earthers to flourish on YouTube by you know offering them all of the publicity and benefits and the algorithm that we aren't afforded. You know, just ultimately every search that could come our way add that onto the list of the opponent's search results and then they'll do very nicely and encourage them and that sort of self-perpetuates. But it's it seems that it's gone beyond that. You need the BBC to tell you not to listen to us now. It's just, it's that one extra... The only reason it caught my attention is because it's like, oh, you you, you literally need, like you say, the um, Ministry of Education. <laughs> what did you call it, Adam? It wasn't that. Ministry of Information. Ministry of Information, right? Your More Ministry of Information way. is telling you, don't listen to Flat Earthers on YouTube. That's essentially what they're telling you. Why? Well, because BBC Randoms, is, because BBC Bite Size is out there. Like, are, are, are they your neighbour? Are they, are they your friend, the people on Bite Size? Are, are they not Randoms? Some tosser I've never met, ever, who's telling me stuff. How is that any different... To somebody on YouTube, they're no more or less random than the tosser who presents bite size, are they? No, but just because you've squashed them with what looked like vending machine on a flat earth pizza pie just tells people don't ascribe anything to flat earth and don't go and listen to them. Now, for me, knowing full well what happens with pop music when the BBC tells you that you shouldn't be listening to it, it goes to number one. So as a millennial or later, hearing the BBC telling you that you shouldn't go and listen to Flat Earthers on YouTube, I would suggest that that might be the beeline that often people take simply because the Ministry of Information have told them not to. Yeah, I was getting ready to say it's probably more detrimental for their uh, um, belief structure to address us at all. The best thing they can do is just stay away from the subject is what they need to do. And that's what they're saying. Just stay away from flat earthers, okay? Meanwhile, No, I mean, not even earth. address that there is a flat earthers. Like, they need to ignore us completely because that's the only way that they're going to be able to maintain this. Oh, I see. So you're saying anything that referenced us would be to their detriment. It's not just that I can parallel it with the fact that they're the Ministry of Information directly telling you not to do something, which often has the reverse effect. 
you're saying it wouldn't matter what they addressed us with in any shape or form. Any address that draws any attention whatsoever to Flat Earth is to their detriment. And I'm inclined to agree. That's why I put this up. Um, this is really good. If we're following one of the views of Gandhi, how you start with a, an issue and how it, how it progresses, we're at stage three. The BBC to be ad homing randoms and using that as a topic of attack. First, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. We're all used to that. We're now at this. Then they fight you. Then you win. Progressing nicely. And I say to see an institution like the BBC use that, that's an underhand way of fighting back. They know they're losing this battle. The BBC wasn't using this kind of ridicule, wouldn't even been on the BBC five years ago. You see the amount of it occurring now. That's them fighting back through the tools they've got, which is their media, their brainwashing. We're winning. So what happens when we get to the tape when they tell their own side not to fight us? Right? No, then that, that's the acceptance remember, stage. That's the, said, that's the stage of acceptance. What? Wouldn't it be fair? Wouldn't it be also fair to say to listen to or pay attention to anything fighter as harsh and coarse as it sounds is another way of them saying remain stupid, stay on the stupid train, remain dumb in the dark, don't don't do any self, you know, critical thinking. I mean, isn't that kind of like an insult? This, I mean, it should be an insult to somebody's intelligence. I, I would say, why don't you want me to? You know what I mean? Yeah. Most people have nah. curiosity, you know? Nah, it's a, it's a tell for a do seven offsuit. So you, what they do is BBC and Neil deGrasse Tyson, they're pretty much the same. And anyone in that uh, category, they're using their position, what they think. They're using their position as a vehicle for their hand wave dismissal. Now, others use their position, like Neil deGrasse Tyson and all the pseudoscientists, just their position as a sounding board for anything what they say is essentially true because they're scientists we know they're pseudoscientists you see you see where i'm going with this yes because we are the exactly. bbc and we inform you only of what is correct and right you shouldn't pay attention to this not because this is wrong for the following reasons you shouldn't no, no. this is the bbc we are telling they have the authority yeah exactly Shout out to Richard G. He says, Nathan and company are awesome. Also, gas pressure requires containment. Just saying. Thank you for the super chat. Agreed. Yeah, good point, Kiwi. Well, the, I, re the, reason, the reason I brought up what I was saying before was that, right, so we have the BBC telling people don't you know, basically ignore flat earthers, right? Well, years ago, I forget how long now, that space.com article came out and it was what was it called it was called how to debate a flat earther and they went through a bunch of points and at the end they summarized it by saying flat earthers don't care about evidence and arguments their problem is that that they don't trust the very people we get our information from right so i think this thing started a while ago with them saying well don't even debate them ignore them and laugh don't fight them because the fighting is the debating right but well, we've come to at this point. We've realized there is no debate, right? So I think this is something that started a while ago, and it's just going to get worse. Now. As Indeed. far as my opinion, I'm, I think it's going to get worse. I'm, see, I'm not distinguish the debate. Go on, Adam. Say one more. Uh, I would distinguish the debating, um, not as fighting. That's them laughing. When I say fighting, I'm not talking about individuals. I'm talking about the system, for the system to have to deal with it. That's the fight that it feels the need. It's never done so before. And I say it's significant that the BBC would ad hom like that, and use that topic to make an underhand point. Why is it feeling the need to defend now and fight now? That's, that's the fight I'm talking about, not necessarily individuals when the topic's coming up that to me is i mean look at the way they behave that's them laughing still 
Like I say, it's the, it's the system that's fighting, not individuals, that I think is significant. Yeah, I totally agree. Right, I'm going to do one last plug. So hopefully when this goes out and the Uncut and After Show goes out to members and on the second channel, there'll be a bit of a plug which will get me at least halfway to my give, so send, go. I have to get rid of the... In that. There it is. No, it's not going to let me. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Okay, so I've changed recently from uh, GoFundMe for campaigns to Give, Send, Go, and Chocolate had extremely well, or good success with it. Uh, so hopefully I'll achieve the same sorts of results uh, in my campaign to replace some very old and aging equipment that keeps going wrong. So I've already, as I explained at the beginning of the show, had a reasonable amount of success to get one amplifier replaced of the three, and I'm hoping to get at least one more. So I'm hoping to get to about half the target that I've got set, which is about £900. Massive shout out to Goldie, who is a mod in the Growing Up in Scientology YouTube channel, who I also plugged at the beginning of this show. So check out my GoFundMe campaign if you did want to actually contribute to the campaign. Just set the tip amount, as it is called, I think, or something like that, down to zero um, by just going to other and then just add whatever amount that you want to contribute. If not, just click on the share button as it's a very convenient way of sharing it around on Facebook and they do make a direct impact on whether or not the campaign is successful. So hopefully a few of you will share it. With that, I'm going to say if you are watching this on either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley primary streams, then stay tuned as there will be an after show to follow. Unfortunately, if you are watching this live, this is where we bid you farewell. So another massive thank you to all of you. Who smashed the super chat, liked, commented, shared, subscribed. Hit up my Give, Send, Go campaign and all that good stuff. Another massive thank you to today's Discord and G Plus panels for making today's live show possible. Once again, stay tuned if you're watching on an after show. I've been Nathan Oakley and I will see you all in the next video. What a lovely day! Is it thinking on its own? No way! Yeah, um, I think it's interesting the way, uh, like, the printing press come along the same time as the Renaissance. Um, you know, it was around that time. And now we have uh, the Internet uh, coming about. Like, I wonder if Flat Earth, uh, or just the understanding of it, is going to be one of the, the changes because of that you're saying as a direct consequence of having the internet the paradigm of the globe will be eradicated leaving us with the obvious and observable truth of the flat nature of earth that we dwell atop right but it seems like whenever there's a new media for information exchange there's always a, a giant shift a, a, par a giant paradigm shift is flat earth going to be caught up in in this um uh, in the internet's emergence well they said they're going to start teaching it in school along with the globe model yeah that was a good question and i wanted to um i was trying to ask eli a question but it, it was i didn't want to interrupt eli when you said it's going to get worse I'm, I'm assuming you mean it's going to get worse for the heliocentric side and not uh, I have this feeling you you continue to confuse me with Eli. I'm chocolate, brother. <laughs> oh, sorry, chocolate. Okay. Sorry, chocolate. <laughs> and sorry, chocolate's chocolate. very yeah. upset today. Sorry, sorry, bro. Sorry, bro. No, no, you're good. You're good. What, what was your question? Bro? Yeah, but yeah. Um, when you said it's gonna, it's only gonna get worse. Um, would you you speaking on behalf of the situation in in general, or for us, or for the heliocentric side? The truth or the or the lie? No, for the lie. For the for the human okay, cool. yeah. Because yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I, I've always said it. The the problem with it is whenever it has to be defended. Right? Okay. I whenever meant, it has I to be defended is when is when it seems like complete nonsense. Right? If you just believe it and that's just your story, your paradigm, then you can just skip along during the day and not worry about it. But when you're forced to defend it, actually come out like a mathematician on a flat earth you know server and say things like yeah you, you know you get a you, of course you have to assume that the earth is spherical before you even 
attempt to get an R, things like that, right? That's not good for their side, no matter how you slice it, right? Because we were called crazy for saying that how many years ago? And now all of a sudden you got mathematicians coming here and telling us that directly? That's funny. So that's what I mean. It's, it's just going to get worse and worse for them. Because it's I not agree like with they come out with every, every day with new, brand new glow proof Cs. Right, we don't have people coming in here every day like, "Hey, dumbasses, look what we got today." No, we got the same old story, the same boats going over the curve, same crap. So yeah, it's going to get worse yeah. for them. Yeah, and they, they all have like to come out and defend it. It's, it seems like it's right, it's Jack and Pandas, and they all choke each other and tell each other the same stories that they came here with and got their asses handed to them. So they all stay over there, mm-hmm. but there's no proof. Yeah. And then you think about it, all the other so-called conspiracy theories of Bigfoot and all this other stuff. They don't go hard on that, but they go hard on flat earth, which means there's something that they're afraid of and more intimidated by. And and it, they, the truth is putting them up against the a truth. hard place on a rock. Where Yeah, the truth is putting them against a hard place on a rock to the point where they 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 slip up and do things like what, what, what a mathematician says and, and admits and concedes. And they continue to. Even now you hear Neil. He's, he's saying a lot of implicit stuff. That's, that's concession to me. I'm catching it. Because his argument is becoming more passive. It's more of like a different tactic they're trying to use now to, to try to keep what little bit of um, face they have. Because they see it. They see the foundation crumbling underneath their feet. D. D Rose, what, what, what do you think? It's strange for an astrophysicist to come on and start teaching about tires and air and tires? That seems a little strange to me. Exactly. Shows that he's listening and I'm back. behind the walls. He's listening behind the walls and throwing his little star watch shows to basically act like he's just, we're going to cover something today that's been pondering on my mind for a while. But no, he's, he's hearing it because if, I don't know if he's hearing it from me, but I know I'm posting the hell out of our shows with a tag on him and his. So he's got to be he's got to be listening. He's got to be hearing it. So he's trying to just pick up the pieces as his foundation is falling. He's trying to pick up the pieces and put it back together so he has something to stand on. Listen, I always said that gas pressure without containment. I don't know. To me, that is will always be the best. I understand it's not a flatterous proof. But that will always be the best because you can understand it. It is part of the nature of matter. It's at the foundation yeah. of how things are. So, yeah, I agree with you, Neil. You can't calculate or define gas pressure without a container. Oh, you can bring three containers with you. And show a demonstration of how retarded you are. Right. So you'd have to redefine the word container in order to seemingly to yourself be able to prove gas pressure without a container. Because you can't. You have to change the meaning of words to do that. You could also say. No, I say, Aaron, Neil, that's what you just said. That in itself is just the basic, that's the first step. We're going to prove to you that gas doesn't need a container. And what do they do? They walk in with the gas inside of a container. Right there. Right there. There should have been a garden tool on the floor that they stepped on and just smacked them right in the forehead and knocked them out from the first step they made. Right there. Yeah, but they just thought of it as not being a container, and then it worked for them. Well, no, that's, no, exactly always... my, that's exactly my point, right? In order to defend it, what did you have to do? To prove gas pressure without a container, your dumbass had to walk in with gas in a container. You know what exactly. I'm saying? Exactly. You see how ridiculous that is? And I agree yeah, with all... Go, you, keep, you keep going ahead and defending this crap, uh, going against natural law, going against things that, that's just reality. You keep doing that. And making yourselves look ridiculous. So then you'll have to write more articles about how you can't debate these guys because they just don't trust the scientists. Nah. Right? Yeah, yeah, so That's what and, they and, sound like to me. Jeez, so, man. 
Go ahead, Neil. You stopped four times. You done? I understand done. you're upset. Go, go, go for it. I'm not upset, man. Go ahead. I waited go for four it. times. I stopped uh, no and need, let Neil. you talk. Okay, so I just wanted to say, oh, it's right. They changed the meaning of words. And they try to say that atmospheric pressure is different than gas pressure. But I will wait a full five seconds to talk with. Yeah. <laughs> well, technically, well, it is different. It's something that doesn't happen in the real world. It only works in their medium, right? So they're talking about a fictional concept in a fictional medium and how it works in that fictional medium so no basically, no no the, no exactly what the they atmospheric do. pressure the paradox oxymoron it's the same because it's gas so you you can't spin it any other way exactly well, they might not be it's having it right. orderly in their heads as such but that is effectively what they're doing well, I'm not in the business you into of a straw man conception and then making you ponder upon their straw man conception. That's the well, entire not really purpose of the globe model. And peel back what's in their head. That doesn't. That's meaningless. Yeah. Right, but we can all agree that it is uh, trying to prove gr gas pressure without a container using two containers inside a very large container is metaphorically the same as like blocking a punch with your face. Just yes. one sec. Just one sec. That's a hillbilly blue balls redneck retard special. Just one sec. Arwin, can you close your mic when people are interrupting you, please? You're causing feedback. Thank you. <laughs> I'm on mute. <laughs> he was defending you. What are you talking time. about? I'm on mute. Oh, do you hear? Um, just to change the topic, just a little bit. I was in Discord last night, and somebody sent me a link of cream of wheat, Mister Fubar. Going all foobar in 20, uh, maybe 35 days. I can't remember. He's going to debate James Tor on the origin of life at Rice University. You delusional nutbag, Dave. You got to have a way out somewhere because this is your ass. So I just want to let everyone know that he's that, that cream of wheat's going to do this. Just, just FYI. The origin of life, does that... that... That would come after the ontological primitives, though, wouldn't it, right? Yes. Okay, we're talking primordial soup versus... Who knows? Greater. <laughs> Who knows what they're... I don't, I don't know anymore what they're going for. I'm guessing it'll be one of those... Well, we'll give, we'll give you that God created the first cell, but we'll talk about... Everything after that is where it'll go. Oh, uh, it's yeah. There's, it's variations on the theme, but I'm just saying that he is going to that Professor Dave, Mister Fubar, cream of wheat, is going to show up personally at Rice University. This is this is going to be in an auditorium. <laughs> what? Yeah, <laughs> he's going to show up at the auditorium. That's cute. Mm. Mr. Sun is rising in the west and setting in the east in the southern hemisphere and being proud of a Mr. Fubar himself, cream of wheat. You talk about delusional. There we go. Yeah, but he's a professor, just, though. Just so only seems reasonable that he's in front of uh, an auditorium full of students, right? Which professor? All of which will be more qualified than him. Correct. That was my <laughs> point. Adam, Adam's got there straight away. Yes, that's right, Adam. So the people sat in front of, uh, he sat in front of, will all be more qualified than he is. Interestingly yeah. enough, I bet you he will be congratulated and uh, his work against flat earthers will be condoned and they'll all celebrate that when they introduce him. Right, possibly. Yeah. But with that, I'm going to say another huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus panels for making this very short after show possible. And of course, a massive thank you to all of you in either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley primary streams for hopefully smashing the super chat, hitting up the Give, Send, Go campaign, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, all that good stuff. I've been Nathan Oakley and I will see you all in the next video.
I want a day. What a lovely day!